Tonight, we are not going to explore an entire portion, not even an entire chapter, nor verse, not even a word, not even a letter of the Torah portion. Rather, we are going to explore a single musical note in the Torah. As you know, the Torah was given with musical notes. When the Torah is read publicly, Mondays, Thursdays, Shabbos, holidays, the Balkore, the one who reads the Torah, reads every single word with a particular note known in Yiddish as trop or as taimim in Hebrew. One of the most rare musical notes to be found in the Torah, there are those that are read frequently, constantly, every verse, sometimes the same, a few in the same verse. One of the most rare notes is called the Shalshelis, which literally means chain. They say in the name of the Vilna Gon that theoretically... If one would not know any words or any words or letters of the Torah, but they would just hear the musical cantillations, the musical notes in which every word is recited, by just hearing the music behind every word, they can theoretically reconstruct the actual word. In other words, the relationship between a musical note and a particular word is never random or coincidental. It's part of the Mesoratic tradition, part of the tradition that was given to Moshe, to Moses. Together with the Torah, also the, the, the cantillations, the musical notes with which we sing each word. So these musical notes have an essential relationship and connection to the actual word. So when he, the Vilna Gaon said, when if you only hear the music, somebody who really understands the full depth of each musical note would understand what is the word the musical note is trying to convey. That's how deep the kinship is. Whenever you come across a musical note that's rare, you must study it and reflect it. And that's what we're going to do tonight on that rare note, Shalshalas, which is found four times in the Torah. Interestingly, three of them in the book of Bereshis of Genesis, one the fourth, in the book of Ayikra, the book of Leviticus. The first time it's found is in the portion of Ayera. You can open up source number one in your curriculums. Right below the video, there is a PDF curriculum. Open up source number one. Vayera, you test Zion, 1916 Genesis. Vayisma ma, and he hesitated. Light hesitated, leaving the city of Sodom, the word Vayismama comes with a shalshelis, a rear note. The second time is source number two. Next week, Chayesara, Vayoymar, Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, is going to search for a shidduch, for a match, for a partner, for his master's son, Yitzchak Isaac, comes to the well, speaks to God, Vayoymar, and he said, the Vayoymar has a shalshalas. The third time is in source number three, Vayeshev. Joseph, Yosef is a servant, a slave in the house of Potiphar. Potiphar's wife, take, Potiphar's wife takes a liking to him. She asks him to engage with her physically. The second line, Yosef refuses. The Vayimoin has a shalshalas. The fourth time is source number four, Tzav. Vayishchat, and he slaughtered, talking about the time when Aaron, the high priest, and his sons dedicate the sanctuary for the first time, and he slaughters the ram. The Vayishchat again has a shalshalas. Four times. What is the significance of this? What does this mean? Well, the Shalshalas note is a very interesting note. It sounds like this. Uh, What does it look like? 
take a look at its image. You could see it in the sources on the screen. Take a look at the image of the shalshalas. It's like the image of the lightning streak, a zigzag line going back and forth. What is the message, the symbolism of this note? The great Jewish philosopher and thinker, Rabbeinu Yosef Ibn Kaspi, suggested the meaning behind the shalshalas. Rabbeinu Yosef Ibn Kaspi lived in the 13th century. He was born in province in southern France. He lived in many other countries, including in France and in Spain. He was a philosopher. He was a scientist. He wrote a commentary on the Torah. And he suggests in his commentary on Beratius that Shalshelas is a musical note which represents uncertainty, indecision. The person is torn, in other words, between two opposite pathways and is having a difficult time making a decision. Therefore, he's stuck in a particular mode and he can't get himself out of it. Listen to the Shalshalas again and imagine it as a psychological movement within the psyche. Um, Okay, move on. No. Um, Move on. No, the Shalshalas goes a third time. Um, Like a broken record player, or today I should say a scratched CD. That's why the Shalshalas is the zigzag. He goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, forth, torn between two sides, swayed in two directions, can't make a decision where to go. Some, some communities, they sing the shalshalas twice, not three times, some three times, but the point is the same. Now we can understand the significance, the unique significance of the Shalshelis note each time it is stated. And we're going to address all the three Shalshelis in the book of Beratius. The Shalshelis in the book of Ayikra is a little more difficult to understand in this context. We'll have to leave it for another lecture. And I'm thankful for the message conveyed tonight to an essay by Britain's chief rabbi, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, and some other sources from which these ideas are culled and developed. Let us begin with the Shalshelas of Chai What is the story of the Shalshelas of Chai Avraham Abraham grows old. His son Yitzchak is not married. He summons his servant. The Torah doesn't say the name of the servant. Just identifies this person as his servant the commentators all identify the servant as Eliezer and asks him to go to his hometown, Choron. Avraham left Choron in Mesopotamia, north of Iraq, between Iraq and Turkey. Avraham left Choron and came to Canaan, but the rest of his family remained in Choron. So he sends the servant to go back to Choron and find perhaps a young woman for his son Yitzchak. Eliezer takes the journey. He comes to Charon. He stands at a well. There, there, he decides to himself that he's going to make a sign how to determine which is the proper girl for Yitzchak. What will be the sign? If a young woman, if a girl approaches the well in order to draw water from the well and he will ask the girl to share some water with him, she will share water with him. She will share water with his animals, with the camels. This display of kindness and generosity will demonstrate that she is the right girl for Yitzchak. It's in this context that there is suddenly a shalshelis. And it's very strange. Where and why? Where the shalshelis comes from and why it was introduced here. And I'm, let's go back to that verse. Source number two. Eliezer is standing at the well. Vayoimar, and he says, source number two, Hashem alekei adini Avram, God, my Lord, the master of Abraham. Hakri no 
Let it happen in front of me today. I say chesed in Adoni Avram. Perform kindness with my master Abraham. And what's the kindness? Let me encounter that girl who is suitable for Yitzchak. A girl comes out and I ask her to give me some of her water and she offers them to me and to my camels. She's the right girl. On the word Vayoymer, again, source number two, look into number two. On the word Vayoymer, and he said, there is a shalshelis. There is that musical note that repeats itself, that zigzag, lightning streak, flash note, the shalshelis. Why? Eliezer said, it's a simple word, Vayoymar. Why is it? Vayoymar. What is the significance of this? Rabbi Yosef Ibn Kaspi suggests an idea. He says Eliezer was doubtful. Can you decide a shidduch based on one simple gesture? People today, sometimes it takes them, especially in certain parts of New York, it takes them years to make a decision. Some it takes months, weeks, whatever the case is, whatever the community, whatever the people, the characters of the people, it's not for tonight. But one gesture, you go to a well and you see that a girl is nice and gracious and kind and that's it. Mazel tov, the shidduch is made, let's go make a wedding, is that enough? Eliezer does it, but not without doubt and uncertainty. Others want to suggest that perhaps Eliezer was worried if he's permitted to do it. To make an omen is very problematic in Judaism. Omens are forbidden. Was this an omen? Was it not? Others explain it wasn't an omen. He was just trying to test her character to see what type of person she is. But there is another interpretation and a critical one, and a very important one. And this takes us to source number five. Open up source number five. And here we have to study a fascinating uh, variation in the biblical texts, which gives birth to a very powerful story. Source number five describes the beginning of the story, Chayesarach of Dalit. Avram asks his servant, go get a, go find a girl for Yitzchak. The servant tells Avram, Perhaps the woman will not want to follow me to this land. Should I bring your son to the land that you left? That's what the servant asks Avram. What does Avram say? No. Yitzchak should not leave the land of Canaan. God shall help you. And if not, you're absolved from the oath that I have made you swear that you're going to find me a girl for Yitzchak. Now, when Eliezer comes to Charam and he finds Rivka, he finds Rebecca at the well and she invites him to her home and he's addressing her family. He repeats the entire story from the beginning. And he tells them how his master has a son, Yitzchak, and summoned him and said, go find a girlfriend. And may, I told my master, perhaps the girl will not want to follow me. But look at the way he repeats this part of the story. The next part of source number five. The first is Genesis 24.5. This is Genesis 24.39. I tell my told my master, perhaps the woman will not follow me. Now take a look at both parts of source number five. Do you see the difference? Rashi saw a major difference. The first time Ulai is spelled with a vav. The second time Ulai is spelled without a vav. You say, what's the difference? <laughs> it's very significant. Ulai means maybe, perhaps. Why the first time when Eliezer tells it to Avram, it's spelled with a vav. The second time without a vav. So Rashi tells us something fascinating. And that is when it's without a vav, it can be read in a different way. Remember, there's no vowels in a Torah. In a Torah scroll, there are no vowels. So therefore, different words can be pronounced in different ways. Ulai with a vav can only be pronounced one way. Ulai, which means maybe. Ulai, without a vav, can be pronounced. Ulai, it can also be pronounced Eilai, which means to me. Zakhtrashi, source number six. Ulai, loisei lecha'isha, Eilai, 
Bas hoy soloi Eliezer Eliezer had a daughter. Vahaya mechazer limtso ila shayoy maloy Avram lifnoi se love la siye bitoi. Eliezer wanted very much that his daughter should marry Yitzchak. So he was searching for a scheme that Avram should tell him and turn to him and ask him if Yitzchak can marry his daughter. Amar loy Avram, Avram told him, Bni baruch vata oror vein oror medabek bebaruch. My son Yitzchak comes from the category called baruch, blessing. You come from the category called oror, a very different category of baruch. And the two cannot cling together. It's not a good match. Ah. Rashi takes this from the Medrash. The Medrash says this in Medrash Rabbah. Eliezer wanted his own daughter to marry Yitzchak. Now Eliezer was very loyal to Abraham. Eliezer was his servant for his whole life. But he had a daughter. And he craved that Yitzchak should marry his daughter. He wanted to be Avram Avinu's mechutten, not only his servant, but also his mechutten. And he wanted his daughter, should be Avram's daughter-in-law and Yitzchak's wife. And this is not just a selfish, narcissistic motive. Eliezer knew who Avram was. And Eliezer knew who Yitzchak was. And that's why Avram can trust Eliezer and dispatch him on the journey to find the right wife for Yitzchak, because he knows that Eliezer will choose the person you have to choose. Knowing this, Eliezer wants his daughter. Avram feels that it would not be a good match. Now we can understand the Shalshalas. When Eliezer is standing at the well and speaking to God and asking God to help him, and do kindness with Avram and bring to the well the girl who is the suitable woman for Yitzchak. There is a shalshalas. There is a sense of ambivalence. There is a sense of fragmentation, of indecisiveness. Sure, Vayoymar, he tells God, do chesed with Avram. But in his heart of hearts, there's a hope. Maybe it won't happen. Maybe no girl will show up. Or not the right girl will show up. And he'll come back empty-handed and he'll say, Rabbeinu Reb Avram, I tried, I prayed, I worked, I searched. To no avail. And finally, Yitzchak, who's getting older, 40-year-old man, Needing a wife, Avram might say, okay, Eliezer, perhaps your daughter. Now, here, it's worth to discuss Eliezer's position. Was this an act of disloyalty on his part? Did he have a separate agenda? Did Avram not know about his agenda? This we're going to explore in next week's class. Join us next week, Monday night, 8.30 p.m. like every week, and we're going to get deeper into what was happening in Eliezer's hearts, how Avraham saw it, how Eliezer saw it, because this itself deserves really a class in and of itself. But one thing we cover tonight, we understand the Shalshalas. Shalshalas is the note of ambivalence. Shalshalas is the music of uncertainty. Shalshalas is the note that captures indecision. Shalshalas is that music that represents a person being torn between two realities, two cravings, two yearnings. Of course I want a girl for Yitzchak here, but I also don't want. It's a shalshalas, the music of ambivalence. As it's been pointed out, there is no word for ambivalence in Hebrew. But there is a note for it. Shalshalas. Even more dramatic is the case of Yosef Atzadik of Joseph. And here we go to the next one. But before that, it's very interesting to note something else. That's a commentary by the Ebenezer. You know, in Hebrew, 
a very rich language, and there are many words often describing the same reality, the same situation, but there are always subtle differences between them, and we have to understand these subtle differences. When Eliezer turns to Avram and says, perhaps the girl will not want to follow me, both times he uses the word ulai. Ulai, right? Perhaps she won't want to follow me. There are other words for perhaps. Pen, shema, but he uses the word ulai. The Eben Ezra, take a look at source number seven, makes a very powerful, interesting comment. Not power, interesting comment. Evan Ezra, Tehillim, Kuf Tezayin Tezayin. Psalms chapter 116, Zakhtar Abbeinu Avram, Evan Ezra, the great 12th century Jewish linguist, philosopher, astronomer, scientist, commentator on Chumash. Vekocha milas ulai, pam shema, upam kemoy misave. The word ulai can have a double meaning. Sometimes it means perhaps, maybe. Sometimes it's a craving maybe this will happen i hope it happens this way for example ulai uchalihi lochem balak turns to bilam i want to curse the jews maybe i can declare war and defeat the jews it's not just maybe as a doubt maybe i want to I hope it will happen. Upam, sometimes it means Shema. For example, Ulai loy Isha. When Eliezer says to Avra, maybe the girl will not want to follow me. Maybe, perhaps. But let's suggest that the Shalshelis tells us that Eliezer's Ulai had also the second meaning. It meant perhaps, but perhaps. It also meant Ulai. Perhaps, just perhaps, the girl will not follow me. Secretly, this is what I hope that this possibility actually materializes. You know, right? You invited somebody to come to you for Shabbos and they're on the phone with you Friday morning and you say, oh, maybe this is not a good week for you. Right? What do you mean by maybe this is not a good week for you? Are you asking a question or are you expressing a prayer? You have an appointment with somebody, you say, oh, maybe this is not a good time for you today. Maybe we can reschedule. Is this really a question, a speculation? What is it? Or it's a hope. It's a fervent hope. Eliezer's Ulai may have also part of the second interpretation. Hence the shalshel is over the word Vayoymar. Let's go to the next story. Yosef HaTzadik. Geval. This is a very, very powerful moment. We all know the story of Joseph loathed by his brothers, plotting to kill him, throw him into a, they throw him into a pit and they sell him as a slave. And he's purchased by the Egyptian nobleman Poitifar, one of Pharaoh's ministers. And he is extremely successful in the home of a servant. But his master's wife takes a very powerful liking to him. Take a look at source number three. Let's learn together. Zak the Pasik. Vahi Acher Advarimeila after this these events. Vatisa Ashis Adoinov Esena al Yosef. The wife of his master raises her eyes towards Yosef at time. She says, Sheikh Vahimi lie with me. Vayim Moain and Yosef refuses. Vayoimir Alashis Adoinov and he tells the wife of his master, Hey na doini la yodi ti me babayas vikhala shayeshli nosam biyodi. My master does not know anything what is happening in this house. He delegated the entire authority over this house to me. And he continues, the only thing that he did not allow me to touch and own is you. You are his wife. How can I commit this great evil to God and to my master and follow your wish to be with you physically? Now I'll take a look at the word in the beginning of Pasuk Ches in source 3. Vayimoyin and Yosef refused and he refused. It has a shalshelas. Vayimoyin. Why? The note of ambivalence tells us here too about a great struggle that went on in Yosef's heart. Let's understand what happened here. Yosef is a 17-year-old boy when he was thrown 
into a pit and then sold as a slave. There are now two major forces quarreling in his heart over what he should do at this moment. On one hand, to acquiesce to Potiphar's wife's seduction and wishes would be a betrayal of everything that Yosef stood for, everything he learned in his home where he grew up, where he was molded, where he was crafted. It would go against Yosef being a member of the family of the covenant, the ethical monotheistic tradition of Avram, of Yitzchak, of Yaakov. It would be a war against everything he believed and everything he was taught by his beloved father, by Jacob. That's clear. On the other hand, there was something else happening. Poitifer's wife threatened him. We see what she did to him as a result of his refusing her requests. She accused him of trying to violate her and threw him into a dungeon. According under natural circumstances, he would have remained there for life. Egypt was not a democracy then. It was not a democracy then. Shady democracy today too. He would have remained in the pit his whole life. Miraculously, after 12 years, he's liberated. He becomes the viceroy of the country, the prime minister of Egypt. The Talmud tells us in Yuma that Potiphar's wife threatened him every single day. She threatened him that if he disobeys her, she will blind him. She will poke his eyes out. She will torture him. She will make his life miserable and she will murder him. Every day she changed her garments, the Talmud says. She was completely infatuated and obsessed with Yosef. Let's remember something else. There was no physical hope for Yosef to go anywhere, to get out. This was his only hope. This was his only place. This was his only refuge. It's before the Torah was given. No one would ever find out. It's a private, intimate thing. The whole society believes in this type of behavior. Egypt is called Erva Sa'ar. It's a morally depraved place on earth. Shtufezima, the rabbis say, a place that was in fat and satura- saturated with, with adultery, with inappropriate, promiscuous relationships. Yosef was a vulnerable slave, had no friend in the world. No ally in the world. No family. This would not give a bad name for his family who sold him into slavery. There would be no signs the next morning on all the shoals. Look what Jacob's son did. Look what Rachel's son did. This was the place where everyone behaved this way. And it was an issue of life and death. The Talmud conveys very graphically the struggle in Yosef's heart. Take a look at source number eight. Zagda Gemara Saita Daflamid Vavamid Beis Tanah Debei Rabbi Yishmol They learned in the yeshiva of Rabbi Yishmol Oyse Hayoyim That day Day it says that Potiphar's wife stayed at home and tried to seduce Joseph. Yom Chagamoy was a holiday everybody went to their pagan temple. She told her family, I am ill. Amra, she said to herself, herself, I cannot find a better day to be, that Joseph will finally agree to be with me like this day. So Joseph comes home, as the verse says, no one is home. Nobody is home, everybody is gone. The only one who's home is the wife of Petifar, She grabbed him by his cloak and said, let's be together. And what happens at the end? We know what happens at the end. Joseph runs out. But she had his cloak in her hand. It tore. And this is how she proved that he was the one who tried to violate her. Was this escape an easy escape for him? Says the Talmud, According to the Talmud, Yosef, Joseph consented to her. But at that moment, the image of his father came 
and appeared to him in the window. In the window of the room where he was together with her, he suddenly sees the visage of his father, Yaakov. Omar Loi, his father, tells Yosef, Joseph, Asidin achecho sheyikosvu al eifoid v'ata b'neim. In the future, all the names of your brothers will be written on the eifoid, on that special garment, the apron that the high priest would wear on each of the two sides of the aphoid right here on the stones. Each one of the tribe's names would be transcribed in the sacred garment of the high priest. Do you want your name shall be erased from them and you shall be called forever an adulterer? By Yonos Yosef escapes, Yosef flees. torment torn between two sides between two worlds there's Yosef the son of Yaakov there's Yosef the grandson of Yitzchak the great grandson of Avram there's Yosef the moral young giant the splendid spirit the great spiritualist is Yosef a slave at somebody else's mercy, being threatened to be tortured and killed in a depraved society away from the family? Vayimayin Yosef refused, but the Torah says there's a shalshelis here. There was ambivalence. There was a struggle. There was a conflict. There was a fight. However, we want to explain it relative to the great level, spiritual level of Yosef. But he refused. And it's this struggle that the Torah pays tribute to by putting a shalshelis on the word Vayimai. Now let us go to the third instance of Bereshis, but chronologically the first in the portion of Ayera. And this is the story of a very strange and shady character in Torah. His name is Light. Light is Abraham's nephew. Avram has a brother, Haran. Haran has a son, Light. Initially, Light accompanied his uncle Avram. His father died young. And Light was together with Avram and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah. But one day they depart. And Light moves to the Jordan Valley, settles in the famous city and prosperous city of Sodom. And is extremely successful there. A machtalebn, as they say in Yiddish. He doesn't only make a living, he settles himself nicely. His daughters marry local men, men of Sadaim. What happens? We know two angels who were at Avram come to Sadaim. They come to light and they warn him that the city is going to be destroyed. They tell him to save his children, to tell any one of his family who lives in Sadaim to get out because the city is going to be completely devastated. They urge him to leave. And this is a moment. Source number one. Open up source number one. Vayeru yutesta zayin. Vayis mamma. And Lloyd hesitated. Vayachziku anoshim biyodu yuviyad ishto yuviyad shnei b'noisa b'chemos Hashem Allah vayetziyu vayanichu michutz l'yir. And the two men hold on to his hand, they grasp his hand, and the hand of his wife, and the hand of both of his daughters, who were living together with him and his wife, because of God's compassion on him. And they schlep him out, they take him out, and they place him outside of the city. They had to grab him and pull him out. Why? Because Vayismama, he hesitated. The word Vayismama has a shalshelis. Vayismama he hesitated. Ah, here is a shalshelis. Hesitation, ambivalence, indecision. What was the hesitation? Why didn't he leave? The hesitation here goes to the core of light's identity. And it's the struggle of light that we must understand well and dedicate a few moments to. You see, 
Loit's shepherds got into a fight with Avraham's shepherds back in the portion of Lech Lech. Abraham tells his nephew, we're brothers, we're friends, let's not quarrel. Let's separate. Sometimes that's the best solution. Boundaries, I go my way, you go my way, and you go your way. Let's stop fighting. And Avram says, the offer is mine, you choose. You want to go right, I go left. You want to go left, I go right. Let us look at Lloyd's decision at that moment. Source number nine. Lloyd lifts up his eyes and suddenly he sees the whole Jordan plain in the land of Canaan, in the land of Canaan, today in Israel. Kulamashka. It's so full of fluid of irrigation. This is before God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. It's like a garden of God going to like the land of Egypt when you're coming to the city of Tzor. Lloyd chooses the entire Jordan plain. Lloyd travels to the east. And they separate man from his brother. Avram and Lloyd separate. Lloyd was very tempted by the city of Sidoim, by the entire valley, by the entire section of the land of Canaan. He was tempted by its nature by its properties by what it was like and apparently he also liked living there there was something that appealed to him in the city of Zdoim and he leaves Avram he comes there and he settles there and he settles there very successfully the rabbis deduce from the verses that Lot was actually appointed a judge in the city of Zdoim we know that his daughters married local men in other words his family managed to assimilate and to integrate into the culture of Sodom. Now, Sodom was not a culture like Abraham's culture. God says Sodom was corrupt and perverse. It's self-centered and narcissistic. Sodom ought to be destroyed and light made it in Sodom. He did well for him, for his daughters, for his wife, for his family. Avraham, in the beginning of Chai Sara, is going to tell the Chittites, I'm an alien and a citizen with you. I'm a foreigner. I'm a ger. I'm not from here. I'm a different person. I'm also a resident. I'm a faithful resident. But I'm a ger. I'm an alien. Light will not identify himself as a ger. I'm not an alien. Light made it into the fabric of Sodom society. The rabbis say, They appointed him to be a leader, to be a, uh, a spokesman, to be a judge, one of the pr- prominent intellectuals and lawmakers of the city of Sodom. But suddenly something happens. Two guests come to his house. We find out there are two angels. They came from Avram's house. They come to Lloyd's house. And suddenly, his own people, his own neighbors, his own friends, his own colleagues, his own partners on the Supreme Court, the journalists, the politicians, the writers, the businessmen, the artists that he's in daily contact with, surround the house. And they demand from him to give away the guests because hospitality is not allowed in Sedoim. And they want to attack Lloyd. And then in one moment, Lloyd comes out to them and says, please, leave my guests alone. They came, al Kain Bo, Betzel Kairosi, they came to my home. Let them live, let them relax. And what do they tell Lloyd? They tell him those fateful words that would be repeated in history over and over again. A man came here to live and he's going to become our moral judge. You, wait. You're a gay. You're an alien. You're a foreigner. You don't belong to us. You're an extraneous growth to Zdaim. You come in here and you're going to tell us what to do, how to live, how to behave. 
We're going to harm you more than them. As the verse says clearly, this is what they told them. At this point, the angels are warning him, this place is going to be destroyed. Out. Go warn your daughters who are married. Go warn your sons-in-law. What happens? He goes and he warns his sons-in-law and his daughters who are married to them. Let's leave. And what does the Torah say? <laughs> his sons-in-law think he's, made, he's a joke. He's joking. He's smocking. They're laughing. It's a jest. They don't take him seriously. They call him a fool, a gesture, a joker, an idiot. At this moment, Sodom is about to be destroyed. It's about to go up in flames. The lifestyle of Sodom is about to end. And the angels turn to light and say, leave. It's time to go. Your place is not here anymore. This is a place of death. It's a place of destruction. Now, what happens to light? On one hand, he knows there's no hope for him in Sodom. No future for him physically. It's going to be destroyed. And he also realizes that Sodom has expelled him psychologically. This is not his place. He was just mocked at by his own sons-in-law. He was just threatened by the very citizens whom he judged. It's not his place. But he can't easily leave. You know why? Because he invested his soul in Sodom. He believed in Sodom. Sodom was his destiny. Sodom was his future. Sodom was his Messiah. Sodom was his utopia. Sodom was life. Peace of him was in Stoim. He can't just say goodbye. Bye, bye, Stoim for eternity. I never want to look at you again. Part of Light's soul and passion was interconnected and intertwined with the people, with the culture, with the Weltanschauung, with the philosophy, with the lifestyle of Stoim. Vayis Mamo. He hesitates. He procrastinates. He's ambivalent. And the angels at the last moment have to, against his own better judgment, pull him out to save him, even though he's not ready to be saved. Why? Why is he not ready to be saved? It's for his own sake. Because he can't really believe that Zdoim is going up in flames. This was the place of goodness for him. This was the place of promise. This is where he wanted to educate his children. This is where he wanted to have grandchildren and live an old, ripe, successful, prosperous age. Was he wrong? He couldn't believe it's going up in flames. Nor could he believe that the people really, really don't like him. That he's really a stranger here. This is his city. On the other hand, on the other hand, he understands another side to it. He knows that the angels have a point. He's torn, and it's that torn spirit that the Torah pays tribute to with the shalshalas over the word vayis mama. In the world of psychology, we have a great term for what light was experiencing. It's the term that was coined in the 1950s by Leon Festinger. Cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is basically the theory that people cannot live with the unbearable tension of two ideas in their mind that simultaneously contradict each other. When we are experiencing two different truths, two different ideas, but the problem is they oppose each other. If one is true, the other one is not true. If one is true, the other one is not true. We will do anything to avoid the dissonance because of the tension it creates in our minds, and we will lie to ourselves, lie to others, repress, deny, crush, not acknowledge, circumvent, as long as we don't have to deal with the realities of cognitive dissonance because it's too difficult to deal with. I mean, it's discussed in many different contexts. I'll give you the famous two examples. One is the, 
in a positive sense, the Ben Franklin effect, and one is the story of the fox and the grapes. You know the story of the fox and the grapes? The old story that there was a fox who was very, very hungry, and the fox saw a beautiful uh, vineyard and a great vine tree, and the fox decided, let me go get those grapes because those are beautiful and delicious, and this is what I would really like to have for lunch. Problem is, the grapes were too tall, and the fox couldn't get up. And apparently it had two of a heavy breakfast, a shveta breakfast, and the fox couldn't get up, and the fox was working and working to try to get the grapes on top, and it couldn't, and from exhaustion it finally fell to the ground and had to go away. And the fox turns to itself and says, eh, those grapes, they're not ripe. They're not edible. <laughs> Why would I even think that I want to work any harder in order to eat sour, horrible grapes that would make me more sick. This is what many people have to do when they can't get the grapes. The grapes suddenly become sour. There's the famous Ben Franklin, what's known as the Ben Franklin effect. Um, Benjamin Franklin describes how he had a political foe who really despised him and said very not nice things about him. What did Franklin do? One day he asked this uh, enemy, political enemy of his for a favor if he could lend him a book. And the man decided to do him the favor and he gave him the book. And a few days later Franklin returned the book with a beautiful complimentary note of gratitude. And Franklin describes that a little while afterwards he suddenly noticed a shift in the person's attitude to him. He was speaking to him with more respect and they became lifelong friends. What happened? This person had to deal with a major dissonance in his mind. I did a favor to somebody who I think is a terrible person. How does that work? He's a terrible person, and I did a favor to him. How can I do a favor to somebody who's a terrible person? So different people can resolve it in different ways. His way of resolving the dissonance was by saying he must not be such a terrible person, and that way he can make sense from the fact that he did him a favor. So the process of cognitive dissonance is very active in people's lives continuously, and one has to notice it. And this is what Light was going through. And sadly, we have a very vivid example for this in the last generation. How many hundreds of thousands of Jews in Austria and Germany were overtaken by cognitive dissonance in the 1930s? As a Jew once told me, he said, a survivor, he said, we were more German than the Germans. We could sing the poetry of Goethe and Schiller better than the Germans. And we can appreciate the music and the philosophy as much as the Germans. The Jews in Germany and Austria assimilated. They intermarried. They rose to the highest echelons of financial success, of artistic success, of human success. And then suddenly there were new voices. And suddenly the very same people and the very same culture that they enhanced so profoundly and they felt so much a part of expelled them from its midst with such venom and unparalleled hatred in human history. How do you put the two things together? You believed in Germany. You believed it was the pinnacle of culture. It was a great substitute for Jerusalem. It was the pinnacle of civilization. It was your future. It was your children's future. It was extraordinary. It's a good place with good people. And suddenly, you're hearing opposite voices. What do you do with that tension? Who's right? Did I make a mistake for 50 years? Was I living a lie? For 80 years, I was living a mistake. Or maybe they don't really mean it. Hitler's a meshugener. He himself doesn't mean it. The others don't mean it. Don't take Mein Kampf seriously. It's a passing moment. And many of them didn't leave when they could have left. And when they had to leave, it was too late. 
or even when they left, it was not without Vayis Mama, without tremendous hesitation, without a tremendous conflict. After all, it's my country, it's my people. Ah! Sometimes a person lives a life a certain way. You live for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. A certain way. And then one day you realize you made a mistake. You grow up. You mature. You realize you erred. It's not easy to look back and say, my old notion was simply erred and this is the new way. We play games with ourselves so that we shouldn't have to face the painful truth with our eyes. And sometimes a person made a decision. You hesitate and hesitate and hesitate. Like the Shalshalis, you go back and forth, you make a decision. But after you make a decision, you must turn back because you're not wholesome with your decision. You made a decision and then for the rest of your life you ask yourself, did I make a mistake? You keep on turning back. I want the old way. And this is what we call post-decision dissonance. And this may explain the story of Light's wife. Light was schlepped out. The angel said, don't look back. Say goodbye to Zdoim forever. It's not you. Don't look back. But Lloyd's wife, even after they left, looks back. She can't say goodbye this time. She can't come to terms with the fact that that's not my life. That that was wrong. It was a mistake. It was foolish. It was horrendous. There's no life there. There's no future there. There's no humanness there. I don't belong there. And what happens? She turns into a pillar of salt. A truth that happens to some people. They turn around and they become paralyzed for life. Psychologically, emotionally. They can't move any longer because they could never get away. They turn around because they're stuck. In Zdaim. This Shalshalas tells us that story of Ayis Mama. In many ways, it's the story of many lives in so many different ways. It's the story of so many people who develop an addiction. And even when everything is being destroyed, they're still in denial. It's people who develop habits lifestyles and even when it's crashing down in their face in front of their eyes they're in denial in many ways it's the story of many a modern Jew in the 19th century when the walls of the ghetto came crashing down in Europe suddenly the Jews were allowed entry into the real world but then they encountered explicit or implicit anti-semitism and how did they deal with it and many of them started to hide their identity in order to feel comfortable in the society around them, they became embarrassed with the fact that they were Jewish. They lost their Goin Yaakov, their sense of identity as Jews. Because they could not deal with the fact that this world that held so much promise for them, the world of emancipation, the world of enlightenment, the world of fraternity, of egalitarianism, of liberty, really despises them. Either they denied it completely. And when they couldn't deny it, they denied their identity extremely heavily, thinking that this will, this will allow them that integration. But it didn't help. The more they hid, the more they were hated, the more they were despised. 
didn't solve the problem of anti-Semitism. What it did do was it did not allow them to live a normal life in which you can be comfortable and proud with who you are and what you are. And this ultimately was the difference between Loit and Avraham. Loit becomes a judge in Sedaim. He intermarries with Daim. He becomes integrated with his Daim. And at the moment of truth, they tell him, you're an alien, you're a stranger, we don't want you. His own sons-in-law from Sedaim look at him as the ultimate fool from the family of Avraham. You're the great fool. The one who tried so hard to integrate and Zdoim became his life is expelled from it. Contrast it with his uncle Avraham. Avraham Avinu was also involved with the society around him. He fed the needy and the poor. He went to war to save the innocent and light. And he was extremely involved in the society around him. But when the Chittites address him, when he wants to buy the plot of Machpel, he says, I'm a citizen, but I'm also an alien. I'm also different. He was loyal to his faith. He was loyal to his tradition. He was loyal to his covenant. And how do they respond to him? The children of Ches. You're a prince of God amidst us. They looked at him with respect. They looked at him with awe. They looked at him with dignity. Because ultimately, the world respects Jews who respect themselves. The world is embarrassed by Jews who are embarrassed with themselves and their Judaism. The Shalshalas is that note which teaches us not to sit on the fence, but to know who we are in the deepest place of our being and share that identity with our loved ones, with our children because ultimately the world wants to see Jews who love Judaism who respect Judaism and are not embarrassed by their faith tradition and history